In our previous video, we looked at indifference curves, a graphical representation, a way to quantify the benefit. So this is the value to us as we look at two goods. And what we're looking at is anything on the indifference curve gives us the same utility, the same level of satisfaction. And we can look at the slope of the indifference curve, which shows us the marginal rate of substitution. How much of one good you're willing to give up to get more of another and maintain that same level of happiness. Higher indifference curves show more happiness. Same indifference curve, same happiness. Now there are two special cases when it comes to indifference curves. The indifference curves we talked about before had three properties and we said that, you know, those three properties hold true, but the indifference curve itself will look different depending on each individual's preference. We have two special cases which have different rules, but then they're gonna look very similar for everyone. So let's look at those two special cases. The first is perfect substitutes. So what does it mean to be a substitute? What we mean is it gives you the same value. Things are the same to you. So if you like Coca-Cola and generic cola the same, you think they taste the same, then you are indifferent between them. You give them the same value. So what does an indifference curve look like for a perfect substitute? Well, let's pick a starting point and think it through. All right. Six Coca-Cola, six brand name Coca-Colas. That is the same to us as what else? Well, is it the same to us as four brand name Coca-Colas? No, because more Coca-Cola is better. So this dot here is gonna be on a higher indifference curve than that one. But what is the same to us as having six Coca-Colas? Well, if you think the generic tastes exactly the same, then having one generic and five Coca-Colas makes no difference to you because you're still getting six cans of pop, right? Or having two generic and three brand name. Two generic, sorry, four brand name is the same to you because again, it's still six cans of pop. So what if it was all generic? Well, you don't care because if you think they are truly perfect substitutes, then in your mind, they taste the same and you don't care which one you have. So notice with the indifference curve for the perfect substitute, it is still downward sloping, okay? But the second uh, property of indifference curves of convex to the origin, right? That was this shape here. It doesn't have that shape. Well, why doesn't it have that shape? It doesn't have that shape because if you like Coca-Cola and generic the same, then the marginal rate of substitution is not changing. We don't have that diminished, that law of diminishing marginal rates of substitution because I don't care if I have lots of Coca-Cola or lots of generic, they're the same to me. So as long as the total number of drinks isn't changing, okay, I don't care which one I have. So perfect substitutes are gonna have indifference curves that are straight lines. Well, we said before that having four Coca-Cola brand name products wasn't as good as having six. But what is the same? Same utility as four brand name Coca-Colas? Well, would be four generic. So here's another indifference curve. It's a lower indifference curve, having only four cans of pop, not as good as six if you're hosting a party. Eight of either brand name or generic, or half and half, is better than having four brand name or four generic or half and half here because this is only four cans and this is eight. So there are an infinite number of indifference curves. We could keep adding more. Higher indifference curves, more happy. In order to decide exactly how many cans of Coca-Cola brand name or generic we're gonna buy, in the next video, we're gonna look at what happens when you add in the constraint, the budget line, and we consider the opportunity cost or the trade-off 
between the price of a Coca-Cola brand name and the price of generic. So when we ultimately make our choices, make our decisions, we maximize the benefits, so highest indifference curve we can get on, but we have to consider our constraint, what we can afford, and we have to consider our costs, particularly the extra cost being the opportunity cost. So we'll do that in subsequent videos. But let's look at a second special case. And this case is perfect complements. Now notice the word complements is spelled with an E, not an I. The word complement with an I means to flatter or praise. The word complement with an E means things go together. Your shirt complements your shorts or your hat or, or whatever. They go together. So when we talk about perfect complements, we're talking about things that give us value only because they're together. So for example, if you will only drink coffee that contains sugar and cream, then the sugar and cream complement the coffee. They only have value to, when they are together. You like your double doubles, okay? So in this example here, we're looking at hamburgers, the patty, and the hamburger bun. So you don't like, let's assume, to just eat the hamburger patty, okay? You don't want just a slab of meat. And let's assume you also don't want to just eat a hamburger bun, a piece of bread. You like bread on the bottom, bread on the top, and a hamburger patty in between. So what does the indifference curve look like for perfect complements? Well, just like all other indifference curves, let's pick a starting point. So let's suppose that we have two hamburger patties. If you have two hamburger patties, okay, and well let's start let's do it this way one hamburger how do you make a hamburger right one hamburger is a bottom bun a top bun and a patty so two buns one patty so what is the same to you same utility same happiness as having a bottom bun a top bun and a patty well what if you had four buns and two patties. Well, if you had four buns and two patties, how many burgers can you make? You make two. If you have two buns, top and bottom, and a patty, how many, bun how many burgers can you make? One. So is that the same to you? Same value, same utility? No, right? Two burgers, better than one burger. So if they're not the same value to us, they need to be on different indifference curves. So if these two points are not on the same indifference curve, what is the same to us as two buns and one patty? Well, what if I had two buns and nine patties? Well, if I had two buns and nine patties, how many hamburgers can I make? One, I make one patty on my two buns and the rest of the patties I toss in the garbage. Okay, now you're saying, wait, 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 that doesn't make any sense. I would never buy nine patties and throw eight of them away. Well, remember, when you make decisions, we have the costs, we have the constraints, and we have the value to us. So the representation of the waste of money is going to be in that budget line aspect. What we're looking at here is quantifying the benefit. What's the happiness, the satisfaction, the value to you? So if I have nine patties and two buns versus one patty and two buns, the amount of satisfaction in terms of my stomach is not rumbling anymore and I'm no longer hungry, it's the same because I'm still making one hamburger. So what else is on this indifference curve? Well, what if I had 10 buns and one patty? How many hamburgers am I making? One. I use two of the buns, top and bottom, and I put a patty in between, and the rest I throw in the garbage. So the value to me is still just one hamburger. So here we have one indifference curve. We could draw more indifference curves that give us a higher level of utility. Well, if we had four buns and two patties, we get two hamburgers. So this is on a higher indifference curve than the one we just drew. 
But what else is on this same indifference curve? Well, what if I had nine patties and four buns? I'm still making two hamburgers and throwing the rest away. What if I had 10 buns and two patties? I'm making two hamburgers and throwing the rest away. Okay. Now this makes an assumption that, that what you like in terms of your complements is you like a two to one ratio. You like two buns to one patty. Maybe you have a different preference and you like, you know, your burgers to have two patties for each top and bottom bun. So then your corner would be in a different place. But perfect complements have that L shape. And they have this L shape because there is this optimal ratio between the two goods that you like together. So you like a double-double, right? You like your coffee with two sugars and two creams. You don't like it with three creams. You don't like it with one sugar. You like it in that optimal combination. And so the corner of these complements is that optimal combination. But higher indifference curves makes us more happy. And we recognize that we could have more of these items, but we wouldn't use them. Okay. Now, where are we actually going to consume? What combination of patties and buns will we actually buy? Well, that's going to depend not only on the value to us in terms of quantifying that benefit, but also the cost to buy the buns, the cost to buy the patties. How much income do we have to spend? What is our constraint? And what is that relative price difference between buns and patties? Because that trade-off between them will impact it as well. So we'll look at that in videos. Right now, we're simply quantifying the benefit with a graphical method called indifference curves to show the value to us. And higher indifference curves show higher utility, more happiness. In the next video, we'll combine that budget line, the constraints and costs, with the indifference curves to then look at how do we decide actually how much to buy and consume.